um, how to find papers. And one of the reasons to do that is because before I want to actually go into reading papers, I want to make sure you can all find things. And one of those will, because one of the exercises you want to do, I'm, you're going to have to get a paper or two. So I'm going to have to make sure you do that. So how many of you have already heard about Google Scholar? Good. Um, how many of you have already used Google Scholar? Good. So uh, I, I'm going to make sure we sh there's a bunch of features of Google Scholar. It, it has made the world of trying to find papers so, so, so much easier than when I started, even than it was five or six years ago. So you'll, in fact, find a few papers here in the Google Scholar. And if the papers are from like 2008, 2009, the number of features and the power of the system has evolved so much from 2009 that it's not even really the same system anymore. Um, so if you go to the Google Scholar page, scholar.google.com, right, you'll find a couple of things at the top. So one of them is uh, called My Citations, My Updates, Alerts, Metrics, Settings. And then there's the part that you probably have used if you've been there, which is the search bar. But I'm not going to start with the search bar. I'm going to actually start with these other things up top. Um, one of the reasons because some of these become very useful, um, for example, alerts. I will show you how to set up alerts. But once you've set up your alerts, so it'll take me to my list of alerts and I can modify those. Um, one of the reasons this is nice is, is the change from being uh, finding papers, being me actively searching and going out and doing things, to being a receiver of Google Alerts, Research Scholar Alerts, and Archive Alerts, where those tools will tell me when a new paper of interest to me gets published. Okay, so if you do this and you take a little bit of time to set them up, you will be kept abreast of the things that at least meet your criteria. They're not necessarily everything that's going on that you need to know about, but you can get by email an alert that says, so-and-so has published a paper, so-and-so has published a paper on this. Um, and so those alerts can be very useful. Um, in my case, a lot of my alerts come because I have this thing called My Citations. Anybody, although I don't know that it'll actually have any meaning until you've actually published a paper, can set up their Google Scholar page. And then you get a page that lists all of your papers and your areas. So my paper, let's go to somebody. Here's Walter Shire. He's one of uh, my past PhD students who's graduated. So it's showing all of his papers. Okay, so this is a way to sometimes do something interesting. If you find somebody that has published a paper you found interesting, look them up as a person in Google Scholar and go find out what other papers they have. In fact, every time you look up an author, it's going to show over here all of their co-authors, which is another way of searching. Okay, so I, I'm not spending a lot of time with the how do I search by typing in a keyword because most of you, that's how you view the world. But viewing the world through just keywords limits you to your vocabulary. One of the most important things, so if I were to go in here and choose a topic that, what's a topic we should look for some papers on? Hmm? Hands-free. Hands 50,000 results. Okay. Ah, only 18,200. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I, I want to use this, well, it also helps if you can actually spell. <laughs> Luckily, Google has figured out how to solve lots of those spelling problems. Then it's 1.2 million. So I spell hands-free with a different word of communication. Um, so there's lots of things in this. And now when I'm doing this search, I have a bunch of choices in how I'm going to do stuff. So over on the side, Google now has search by date. And it will show you papers added in the last year sorted by date. This is useful to find if you've been doing stuff and you did a search last year. You don't want to do the same search as you did last year because most of you are going to find is all the things you found last year. But if every six months you go in and you search for all the things by date, you can find all the new things with the same search term. So this can help you very easily keep up to date. The sort by relevance is tricky. Um, Google's algorithm for relevance are things that I don't always understand. Um, generally, they tend to put stuff where they have, oh, I, for some reason I had quotes. Um, that will change the way some of the things show up. Um, but you'll see here the first thing is actually a patent. I'm not sure why. It's only cited by one person, but it exactly matched the string. It's a patent. It has at least one citation. Google is going to sort them on Google's idea of relevance. This might actually have a lot of links, or maybe it's a patent owned by Google. I don't know. Um, you know, we get down here some of the other papers. So one of the most important things when you're playing with Google Scholar is this link over here that says cited by. Okay, so first of all, this is telling you that this paper, hands-free wireless communication in a vehicle, which again is a patent, 
has been cited 207 times. That tells you a lot that 207 people thought this patent, not actually a paper, was important enough that they wanted to cite it. Now, patents cited, but also papers can cite it. So now I'm going to get rid of patents because, in fact, a lot of these, when you get into certain areas, they're dominated by patents. Now I'm just looking at papers. So I've just clicked the box to get rid of patents. And as I'm doing that, I'm now getting the uh, papers. And again, the papers are not in citation order. You'll see the first one's got 89, then 77, 23, 19, oh, then 35, then 63. So it's not just citation order. Google has a lot of other metrics it uses to decide how relevant it is. Some of them include the venue it was in. So a something that shows up in a weaker conference or in a weaker venue will be less highly ordered by Google than something that shows up in a higher ranked venue, even if the Google, uh, sorry, even if the number of citations to that particular paper are different. So Google uses the venue. Now, how do you decide how good is a venue? So this is in the journal called Signal Processing. Um, this one down here, even though it has a lot of citations, is in something called Speech Communication. 88 references, 89 references, 77. Why are they in these different orders? This is actually a conference, a IEEE conference on uh, acoustic speech and signal processing. So how do you think I find out about those metrics? Now, I'm going to actually spend a lot more time in metrics later, but this is the reason I actually wanted to start at the top of the Google Scholar page. There's this thing up here called metrics. And we'll talk about what those metrics mean, but I can go into here and I can search for journals that have the word communication. That's particularly annoying because it's not what Tom was looking for in terms of communications. A lot of these are because the word communications gets used as like, well, I'm the communications magazine, right? Or chemical communications. This is papers about chemistry, not very relevant. IEEE communications magazine would be useful. So the next thing I'm going to show you is actually how to find some of the most highly cited papers in any particular venue. So if I look at the IEEE transactions on wireless communications, this link over here, and we'll talk about what the H index means, but this link is going to give me, in this case, 78 papers that have a lot of citations. So these are some of the most highly cited papers in a field. Okay, And it's not, necessar it's not necessarily the case that they will have any of the words that I search for. Because, in fact, hands-free communication might go by a completely different feel, set of phrases when they describe it in their particular sub-area. Okay? And some of them won't. But you know, if they're dealing with femtocells, that actually is probably like mobile communication. But they're a special sub-area, so they're not going to use the same phrase as other things might. So you might, you might find this another useful way of exploring. Um, the second way, which I forgot, so in here, by the way, you can actually look up subfields, so you can go into computer science and do the same thing where I can now look at, say, computational linguistics, if I wanted to find papers in that. It'll show me the top publications. Some of these are conferences, some of these are journals, and then again, there's a list of the, 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 the top papers in that field, top cited papers. Not necessarily the most important, but these papers have the highest citations in this particular journal or this particular conference. So this is a different way of exploring that you might not have seen. I wanted to show you some of those. If I go back to actually getting on papers, so um, and I can actually go back to the top of Google Scholar. So this first list, I didn't search for anything. I didn't choose a subfield. These are just the most significant cited publications of any kind. So the most highly cited publication studied by Google is Nature, the journal called Nature. Um, and we'll talk more about that later in science. So these are very prestigious publications. Um, they only show the top 100, so they're a little bit tougher. So if I go back into Scholar and we'll use a different topic, um, privacy, I can then find all the things that have the word privacy in them. It is not the same if I use the word privacy here. The word privacy has to show up in the title, as opposed to if I went under computer science and engineering and look for subcategories. Um, well, actually, maybe privacy is not a subcategory. But if I put in the word computer vision and I search for the word vision, not every journal, in fact, this journal, Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence, that's the t second most significant publication in vision. It does not have the word vision in its title. So again, keywords, 
will only find you things that match keywords. And you want to be broader as you're looking for stuff. The same is going to be true when I look at papers. So, um, oh, so I, I mentioned like my updates and alerts. Because of my citations, the stuff I've done in Google, it's now telling me that these two papers, and actually this is what I normally see. Here's the, the 46 papers Google is telling me I need to read this week. <laughs> these are pretty much weekly updates I get that Google is showing me. These are things that recently came out that I should be aware of. And if you're keeping up in your field, this is what you do. You look at these things and you figure out, is there something you need to do? So when we get into reading papers, one of the reasons I'm going to show you some stuff is I've now got to decide which of these 46 papers this week I'm going to actually deal with. Um, and uh, so if I click on any one of these, these are all going to be new, so they won't show me the same kinds of stuff. So I'm going to go back in, and those are actually probably not a week. 46 is more. That's a month because I, I took vacation. I haven't caught up late. Um, but if I go back in here and I say I do privacy, I'll go back and I'll search for that. So there's some only I could spell. Um, so, uh, so here's a paper on privacy preserving data mining cited by 2,000 people. Okay, so this is a 2000, year 2000 paper. Now, one of the things you can do in Google, if you didn't know this, is I can now search within those papers. So there's a little button here that lets me go in and say, now, among all the papers that cited that paper, this, I, I'm not going to search for new keywords. And the reason is because Google's only going to show, you search for some set of keywords, Google will only show you a thousand things. So if you go through every page for that keyword, you're only going to see the top thousand. The stuff you're looking for may not be in there. So you have to learn how to refine searches to find what you want. Now, most of you probably don't even have the patience to go through the first thousand. You're probably the first five or six pages, and then it's changed the search words. Well, changing the search words will get you different answers, but it won't necessarily refine your search, which is something different. So if you find a paper that's actually relevant, and especially a paper that's well cited and relevant, then finding the things that cited it become another way of refining and finding other things that are, that are very useful. Um, so as soon as you find one good paper, especially one good paper that's a little bit old, look at what is was cited by. Now the next thing you can do is um, you can not only, so here's data breaches coming back to the security side, right? So there's a cited by, but there's this other thing called related articles. And if you haven't clicked on that, you should as well. Now it's going to give you uh, it, around uh, between 100 and 500 or a thousand, depending on what the topic you're looking at, related articles, and related articles may have no keywords in common. Google, underlying Google, includes some things that it's looking at what it considers concepts, and it maps a bunch of keywords into concepts. And once it's a concept, other things that have the same concept are related. So you'll find things that might help you get a completely different lexicon, because what you use the word in your field might in another field be called something very different. You don't want to limit yourself just to computer science. One of the things you'll find in lots of fields of computer science from a research point of view and a paper point of view is we like to borrow. This field over here has used this problem, and now we can turn it into a computer science problem and help them solve it or adapt their techniques. So importing problems and techniques, this is where the something of related articles can be very useful because related articles can end up in completely different fields. So here's one on financial cryptography and data security. right? And I started with privacy, and now I'm into identity theft. And if I hadn't thought of using, well, obviously, lack of privacy can lead to identity theft. There's a chain that gets you there. But if you hadn't thought of that chain, you might not have found those papers. So you'd be broad when you're searching around in that. Um, and then, so inside Google, after I found things, you can actually start building up this thing called My Library, where when I click, actually, if I go, I guess I go the other way around. If I click on a paper, I don't want to add anything, because then it's just like, is it going to become useless? I'll search for something I already have just so that I can find one of my own papers. So if I go on here and I click on saved, right, it's going to add it to my library. And so this becomes another way of maintaining your reading list. If you're using Google Scholar, you just click on these things and save them. You can use them. Once I have my library, I can also do things like export it in various formats. I can label it so that I can create a set of labels. So if you're working on managing your, say, a survey paper, you can have sub-labels, so you could have one on privacy and one on security and one on identity. You can start adding a bunch of labels and manage your own labels. So this has now become a tool to help you manage all of the papers you're interested in. 
Right? These are features that were added in the last two years. So if you haven't seen these features and you've been using Google Scholar, there's a lot there to explore to help things. Um, I hadn't mentioned this, but I assume everyone knows this. Um, if I've searched in Google Scholar for a paper and it shows up over here, it's going to tell me where I can get the PDF of that paper. It's important to note that Campus, where it says like full text at UCCS, um, and various other places, even some of the other ones, you need to be on campus for that to work. And if you're off campus and you want it to work, then use the campus VPN. And the, the library here has a thing called a proxy. And if you use the library proxy, then it's as though you're on campus and Google Scholar will still find all those things. Otherwise, you have to learn how to go into the library's database system itself and search for stuff. I will briefly show you that. So if you go to, I say I go to many libraries, L-I-B-R-A-R-Y dot um, If I go into the Kramer Family Library, there are things in here where I can search and they have some databases. There's only one database that, that I thought I think is actually, um, and this is not how I got here before. Um, there's a bunch of databases. The one database that, that Google Scholar does not include, so if I go into computer science, it's going to show me some things. There's one library here towards the bottom, which is the library of dissertations and theses. And you can find every published thesis from any major and lots of minor universities anywhere in the world. So for those guys in Saudi, you want to find some stuff in Arabic, you can actually still search in here and find maybe from your own university. Find your, But theses are things that are so voluminous. But the other reason Google doesn't include all of these is because they're actually often behind paywalls. So despite the fact that Google tries very hard and Google's really good at indexing, there are some organizations that feel threatened by Google, I guess, and therefore they don't let Google inside of their paywalls. And this is just one of them. There's a couple of other journals and stuff. Most of the journals have recognized that they need to do this. But these people make most of their money because you pay to put your thesis in. No one ever looks at it, so it, there's not much pay going out. So, but they don't let Google in. But if you find a, a citation someplace that says somebody's thesis, and you're trying to figure out where I can get this, you can try writing to the author. The university might have it, but it's often much easier to just go in here and get their master. And many master's theses are in here. So you can go see if, you're, if you are in here. Does somebody want to find themselves? Well, I, I won't do that. But you go in, play with it. It's just one of the things that, that I, I was a little bit annoyed. Google doesn't index it yet. Maybe someday they'll get there. Um, there's lots of other things that they probably don't. So there's all these other libraries, but most of these are now synthesized inside of Google Scholar, and Google Scholar will tell you if they're there. Um, in other fields outside of computer science, that's not as good. So other people really need the library to do this, but Google is a computer company, so if it's computer-oriented, they've done a good job of indexing it. Um, there are some business things if you go on the business side or if you're looking at social things. So those of you who are worried about like the social aspect, a bunch of social science libraries are not as well indexed by Google. So then you might have to go in here and look under social science. So if we're looking for um, sociology or political science, you'll find a lot of other things in here that you won't find indexed by Google. And I'll, again, part of that is because some of them are pay and they don't let Google in for free. Um, now, that's one of three places I wanted to show you about searching papers. Um, so another is ResearchGate. Do people know what ResearchGate is? How many people know? Okay, ResearchGate is a, a, is a growing attempt to build a better way of sharing research information. It's free to join, to log in. And again, part of this is you as a researcher can build your own profile here. And once you have your profile, it'll know about your publications. Every time people cite your papers, I get a weekly report. So it'll tell me that um, I've got paper, every time a paper reaches 50 or 100 or certain views or citations, it tells me, it'll show me the profile, my profile view shows me how many people have looked at me, how many people have viewed my publications, how many have been downloaded in the last week, and for most of these numbers, I can actually click on it and find out for the last week, what are my top downloads? What of my work is being downloaded? Who's downloading it? What countries? What papers are being downloaded? So it allows me to track. Now, you guys are all starting, so you can't see that. 
but it has a feature that works the other way around. You can actually go in here, and this looks like I have more requests, people asking me for my papers. So if you find a paper in Google Scholar that you can't find for free on the web, and you can't get it, one of the things you might do is go into ResearchGate and see, does that author have an account? And if so, can they send you a paper? So we'll talk a little about uploading after when we talk about writing, but uh, this paper is not something that I have the right to put up on the web because of the way it was published. But I can send them a copy privately. So I get these requests and then I send off copies of my papers because that'll help them. So that's a way for you to get papers you're having a hard time finding is go into ResearchGate, see if you can find the authors. Sometimes the authors will actually have them in ResearchGate. Um, ResearchGate is currently a, a highly controversial thing. A number of the publishers are trying to stop people. The IEEE, for example, gives me the right to put my paper on my website. It does not give me the right to put my paper in ResearchGate because then research becomes, a, becomes an aggregator that's competing with IEEE. You want to go to my website, that's fine, but they don't really want a lot of stuff in, in um, there. Um, so the other thing you can do inside ResearchGate is you can actually, um, of course that's me, I don't know. Um, I, I really don't want to follow somebody I don't know. Well, here, I'll, 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 I'll follow Fisishan Ramesh. This is a guy I know in Germany. We've actually done some papers. So if I go to a researcher that I like, and I click on follow. Now, every time Ramesh publishes a new paper, I will get an email. This is a little bit like the same thing I could do in Google Scholar, where I can do the same thing. But some people don't have Google Scholar pages. Ramesh does not. But he has a ResearchGate page. So then two different tools. You get similar behaviors out of this, all of the same kinds of things. So, um, Again, in here, you can search by people. I can search by topics. So I can put in a search word. It'll find me researchers in that field, something a Google Scholar does not give me as researchers, although I forgot to show you how to do that. You can. Um, there's questions. You can actually post questions in here, get publications, do a bunch of things. So a sec another useful tool for finding papers. Um, and then I also showed you a little bit about the library. Just for completeness, I'm going to academic.microsoft.com which I guess is not where it is. Uh, Microsoft maintains something called the Microsoft Academic Search. Oh, it's academic.research.microsoft. And this is yet another place where you can go in and search for, uh, you can do again, search by keywords. You can search by uh, authors, by conferences. You can find lists of top conferences. All this information is redundant, but also different. Even what, every one of them is slightly different in terms of what they do. There are papers that, of mine that show up in here that are not indexed by Google. I never figured out why. Actually, I, I never figured out why, but I added them, so now they're in Google. But they all have crawlers. They all find different things, so it can still be a quick, uh, useful thing to find, find it. In different fields, you can go in and see the top conferences. Um, it already knows that I'm in computer science, so it's showing me those kinds of things. Um, there are a couple of other cool features in here. If I look for authors, if I find an author, so again, I'll just use me because I know what I'll find. Um, no, I want authors, not fields of study, but it fails to figure out what I want. So, well, uh, <laughs> sorry, server error. Um, they, they have some cool features in terms of finding co-authors. They build a graph. You can walk the graph of, graph of co-authors and then do searches over subgraphs. Um, but clearly, they're having some problems. And maybe you can only do some of those things. It's been signed in. Um, this has been in beta for six years. Um, there are a couple of other uh, databases in the library. As I said, if you're in the softer side, you might need some of that stuff. Most of the hardcore engineering stuff, Google Scholar and ResearchGate will have a pretty good job for. Um, so I, I said a little bit about understanding venues. Um, so in terms of the Google Scholar metrics or the IEEE thing, right? if I go into these metrics, it'll show me something about these venues. And in general, the bigger this number, <laughs> the better the venue in one, one way. Um, the second way we actually talk about the quality of venues is by their acceptance rates. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But acceptance rates have no standard place of finding them. But you can do things like search for a conference name. Um, so let's say I was looking for software. Define radio conferences. 
acceptance rates. Um, so various conferences will call themselves the premier, and who knows, maybe this really is. Um, but if they don't tell you their acceptance rates, they're not going to meet our department's definition of selective. Because you have to have something that has a published acceptance rate less than 40%. Now, sometimes what you will find, so here's one, for example, where the proceedings of this workshop, in one of their uh, papers, so sometimes what you'll find is that the first paper is a message from the chair. So sometimes called message from the chair, sometimes just called like the proceedings. They'll have a part of the paper where they say something like, this is how many papers were accepted. So if they said they had 40 papers submitted, 26 were accepted, then you can do the math. They don't actually have to publish the word acceptance rate. It'll just be looking at overall the, the ratio of submitted papers and accepted papers gives you that rate. Um, so that's just something you'll, you'll need to know when you're looking at the quality venue. Acceptance rates are not near as good as citation rates for understanding the quality. But when something is new, we have no idea how many people are going to cite it. If it's small, it might only have a small number of papers, but they're actually of pretty good quality. So the metrics have some issues, and so you'll be able to go through those. Um, in almost every field, if I did something like search for the best conference list, um, some researcher someplace has probably made a web page with the list of the best conferences. But maybe not. And if they haven't, and you're starting to do research in this area, maybe you should. Then other people will be looking at you as here's the best conferences. And very often, best conferences are just going to be determined by acceptance rates, the number of people who attend, their, their metrics, and whatever. So it's not that hard to, to build some of those kinds of things. Any questions on quality venue? We'll talk about it more. The biggest thing I would say is if you're not sure, talk to your advisor. Because I just came back from a conference where last year it was actually a pretty good conference. This year it was pretty bad. My, you know, I wasn't sure. I'd never really heard of it. But last year their acceptance rate was pretty good. So we decided to go ahead and go with it. Your advisor will probably have a much better feel in your sub area for what's good and what's not. Um, and then they will balance because the higher the, the select, or sorry, the lower the selectivity rate, right? The more papers they reject, the harder it is for you to get in. And then you have a trade-off. You want to get a paper in. So if I go for something that's got a 10% acceptance rate, you're probably not going to get your first paper in there. So you got to find some balance. Why, your paper was Why was my paper rejected? Well, yeah, so, so well, when we talk about writing papers, I will show you actual rejection letters and a bunch of stuff. My papers get rejected lots of times for lots of different reasons, so there's not an answer. Um, but normally, it's because it didn't meet the criterion for that conference. Sometimes it's not the right conference. Sometimes it's the right conference and the paper's just not good. Sometimes the paper, the concept is good and the paper is badly written. Other times, the paper is well written and the concept's bad. <laughs> Um, but when a conference, especially when you get to small numbers, if a conference can only accept 20% of its papers, and sometimes they can only accept 20% of its papers because it's a three-day conference, they can have literally this many talks, and they're, they're only going to have talks, there's no posters, well then if 2,000 people submit and they can only have 200 talks, then it's 10%, right? So my field, computer vision, this year's conference, 